Welcome to episode number 85 of Breaking Business Barriers. Can't tell you how excited I am to uh, share this story with our listeners. It is one It is one for the ages. He's been telling it now for years upon years, including like a 3,000 hour video diary, which was pretty amazing when I dug into that and took, took a look at it. But before we get started with Rick, again, this is uh, Brent Duhane. Your host and Jared Ty, Bio with Ty, co-host of Breaking Business Barriers. And again, this is episode number 85. Let's thank our folks over at American Option Insurance. If you have some insurance needs, just give those guys a call and uh, you can find them easily. Just Google American Option Insurance, you'll find them. But Rick, Rick, thank you for joining us. But Jared, man, you, you're doing the intro today, man. Brent, I'm so excited to have Rick on. Uh, Rick, I was so surprised to find out that you and I were connected <laughs> yeah. a couple weeks ago. Uh, so I run a uh, networking group on uh, Facebook and uh, Rick commented on somebody's post and I clicked on Rick's profile and I saw you with your, your legendary fedora there. <laughs> and I left a comment back. I said, Rick, are you you? <laughs> Because at first I did, I wasn't sure it was actually you. So I hear that I a lot. We, we've been connected for two years now, and I didn't even know it. So, what are the odds of that? Yeah, yeah, quite, quite, quite astronomical. Well, we sure appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule in Oslo, which I believe it's about uh, uh, seven o'clock there. It's about dinner time. Appreciate you coming on our show, man. It's really nice to be here, Jared. Like I said, uh, if you hadn't have been on me so much, I probably wouldn't be here. So you were tenacious, <laughs> and it worked out. Well, I'm in sales for a living, so. <laughs> so there's lessons. There's lessons to be learned here, and, and as we get into Rick's story, there's lessons to be learned here. You know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, people that are in business for themselves, and and Rick has an incredible story. And <clears throat> we're not gonna we're not gonna even probably scratch the surface of it. But I, I encourage everyone to go out there. Simply uh, do the do the Google and take a look at a, a human being's amazing story, overcoming challenges, and as we like to use our theme here, breaking business barriers and and the forks in the road. And no doubt, Rick, you've had a few forks in the road. Man, this is a this this is a big story. Going to condense it, but Rick, let's let's go back to when you're you're younger and you did. I, I just thought this was amazing because we have a lot of young young entrepreneurs aspiring all the way down to high school kids. We've had high school kids that are amazing brains that have been on this all the way to CEOs that have been there, done it, and are still climbing the mountain. But you want to talk a little bit about what the heck encouraged you or gave you the insight to uh, do a video diary. And I might be wrong here, but it was over 3000 hours. Is that right? Yeah. 3000 hours of diaries that that spanned uh, 40 years. Uh, I, I started at age 14 uh, when I got my first home movie camera. I started turning the camera on myself and talking to it and uh, talk about the world around me, what I was going through, and it, it just became a habit. So I, I went from home movie film, three minute reels, to uh, finally video once the, the video cameras were cheap enough that I could afford one. So from my teenagehood all the way through adulthood, I, instead of writing down in, in a journal, I would just talk to a camera and I never looked at any of them. I just did them when a tape got full, I threw it in the box and I went to the next tape. And I never thought about looking at them. I never thought about doing anything with them. It was just kind of a therapy, uh, sort of self therapy, just talking to the camera about what I'd gone through that day. Uh, as it turned out, I, I ended up becoming a television reporter at age 21. Uh, so I had both sides for almost 30 years. I had both sides, my private life recorded every day and my being on television every day. So you had the professional and the amateur. And uh, in 2000, a friend of mine decided that, Rick, you've had such a life. We have got to make a movie of this thing, a documentary. So they took the personal, they took the business videos, they melted them together. And that's where the film TV Junkie came out. Uh, TV Junkie it was just basically an autobi autobiography of my life. Uh, we took it to Sundance in 2006 when it was finished, and we won the Sundance Film Festival for Best Documentary. That, in, in looking back at that, and again, we, we really, I mean, in today's world, video is, is pretty popular, but people still get nervous about, well, what am I going to look like on video and this, that, and that. You were doing it before it ever became anything. 
and uh, it was part of your daily life. Like you said, it was maybe some therapy and and uh, it was someone to talk to. Is that camera a good friend of yours? Yeah, the camera was my best friend for nearly 40, 45 years. Um, I actually stopped doing the video diaries five years ago because I had a house fire shortly after I had left the uh, GW Zoo where Joe Exotic was. And in that house fire, I'd lost 15 years worth of videotapes and all of my 40 years of personal tapes. So uh, I, it, it broke my heart to lose it all because I thought about coming out with another film 20 years later. Uh, but, but I stopped doing the video diaries. I still do them a little bit. It's kind of habit. It's kind of stuck inside of me. But I don't do them on a daily basis anymore. Do you encourage, uh, let, let's, let's dive into our younger, younger listeners, Rick. Do you encourage something like that? Don't be nervous. Get out there. Document your life. I mean, in, in today's world, especially with all this 2020 stuff that we've dealt with as, as we record this with the, with the virus, a little advice to our, our younger listeners along with everyone else? Yeah, you know, younger listeners, and we all now have a video camera in our telephone, which I didn't have growing up, and obviously until about 1999. Uh, but everybody has a camera, and I'll, I'll tell you the one thing, uh, it's really nice at the end of the day to have somebody to talk to that doesn't talk back. It's almost like having a personal therapist. If you just tell your story for that day and put it away, you kind of feel a little healed inside over what all went, went on during that day. So younger kids, uh, it's a great time to start when you're young, but it's a great time to start when you're older. You could be just still start doing it just for the therapy, just to be able to talk and get it out. You know, they always say when you go through trauma, and I've been to many psychiatrists after several trauma events in my life, they always say the more you talk about it, the better you'll feel. It's very, very true. And that's that was the benefit of doing these home diaries is that I was talking through my day and I could go to bed at night and sleep peacefully. So I think for the younger, uh, the younger kids, the younger youth watching this thing, uh, you got the camera, why not? Just try it. You know, the, uh, young people today are, are, are more apt to text than they are to talk. And it's a really good practice to be able to just talk to yourself in the camera for when you get on the phone or get on the video in business and talk with business associates. Uh, you, you've got to go face to face in order to get anything done in this world. You can't do everything on a text. Amazing advice, and uh, Jared, I know you you've got a couple of burning questions for uh, for Rick, certainly. So, Rick, you have such an amazing story. Uh, I mean, your story would be fascinating, you know, even without all the Tiger King stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you were first on TV at age sixteen uh, for American Bandstand with with Dick Clark. Is that right? Yeah, I had a friend. I lived in Anaheim, California, which is about thirty miles south of Los Angeles. And uh, I had a friend who was a dancer on American Bandstand. And uh, I pleaded with him, take me, take me. And he, he actually took me. And as it happened, Dick Clark, the host of American Bandstand, picked me to be on what was called Raider Record, where he interviewed two people, one girl, one guy, and had them rate these songs. And so instantly, I became a regular on American Bandstand. I was actually 15 when I started. And I did it for about a year. And uh, Dick Clark was the one who in encouraged me to go on and have a television career. He said, Rick, if you want it that bad, go for it. Get your education, go to radio school, go to television school, go to college, just go out there and do it. You know, Dick gave me advice that I, that I think really led to my entire career when he, he said, Rick, how bad do you want it? How bad do you really want it? Because anybody can have anything depending on how bad you want it because then you're willing to put in the work and the time and the effort to go out and get it. That's amazing advice. And so, and you ended up being a host on Inside Edition, I read, and uh, you interviewed uh, President George H.W. Uh, Bush. Yes. Uh, super cool. And, and again, there's just so much information. We've only got 30 minutes here. I, I think any one of these topics would just be fascinating. Um, and then jumping over to uh, Tiger King. So can, can you tell us a little bit about how you learned about um, Joe, uh, Joe Exotic and, and, and how you decided to go and document what was going on on that ranch? Yeah, I, um, I left television news after 30 years of it and uh, became a freelancer about 15 years ago. And so I was making commercials, uh, helping other people make films. Uh, doing various uh, freelance projects, and I was kind of in a lull at the time. This was back in 2015, 2014, 
And uh, I was in a lull, I was looking for a new project. And one day it just, my phone lit up, my email lit up, I, I was getting messages, right? I mean, it went like on fire. And it was all of my friends saying, Rick, there's this crazy zookeeper up in Oklahoma and he's looking for a producer for his internet TV show. And they, they said, you've got to, this is you. This, this guy, he's crazy. He, put, he, uh, he promotes himself as the gay redneck cowboy zookeeper. <laughs> and he carries a gun and he shoots his gun around in the zoo. And I thought, wow, I could make a reality TV show out of this guy. So I, I called him up and uh, I said, uh, is this Joe? He goes, yeah. And I said, Joe, I said, I understand you're looking for a producer. My name's Rick Kirkham. He said, I know who you are. Get the hell up here. Let's talk. And uh, I literally went up that night and I never left the zoo. I ended up staying in the zoo overnight. Uh, I did a deal with him that I would produce his internet TV show, which was really unknown to people. There weren't but 60 or 80 people a night that watched it. But I told him, I'll, I'll produce your show, but you have to sign a contract and let me make a reality TV show of the whole zoo with the cameras following you, everything. And he said, it's a deal, it's a deal. So um, I ended up living in the zoo for a year with Joe Exotic. And as it turned out, it was probably one of the most tumultuous years for him. Uh, it, it was, it's hard to explain what it's like living inside of a zoo with 600 tigers and lions, another 500 uh, uh, different animals from camels to bears. Uh, for one thing, I, I lived in a mobile home that was inside the zoo. And of course, Joe Exotic was nuts, but it, it was so dirty is the one thing I remember because all the dander from these animals, all of the dust from these animals walking around in cages, you were constantly dirty. You never got clean. If you took a shower, the minute you went outside, you were dirty again. So for a year, I felt like I hadn't had a shower. And that's the one thing that really stands out. Uh, Joe Exotic was a character, he was made for reality TV. Uh, he really was. And uh, had he not gone off the deep end and committed the crimes that, uh, that he's been convicted of and now serving time in jail for, uh, he, I think the reality show would have been as big or bigger than the Netflix documentary Tiger King. Uh, Tiger King just assured me that what I thought was a reality show really would have worked. It would have been big. Uh, unfortunately, the videotapes and everything we shot for a year uh, was destroyed in a, a zoo fire of a studio caught fire one night and burned all of our video. We lost the entire show. So the only video that Netflix had for the documentary when they came out with Tiger King was footage that I had here in my possession, very little. But when I say very little, it was six, seven parts on Netflix. But for me, it was very little footage, uh, maybe 20, 30 hours worth of footage. And uh, Netflix said, that's enough. We can make this thing go. And obviously we all know how big it was. Rick, that had to be that had to be going going from uh, maybe the kind of the comfort zone. I don't know if that you've ever been in a comfort zone, quite honestly, and 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 reading reading through. But going out and being a being a freelancer, and then making this decision to traverse traverse up to Oklahoma to see this guy, it had to be a not just a personal commitment, but that had to be a pretty big financial commitment as well. You know, uh, uh, another thing that I live by, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If you don't try, if you don't risk, you're not going to get a shot at getting anything. And I've always lived my life with taking that risk, taking that shot. Every, everything that I come across is an opportunity in my life. And I'm, I'm the kind of person that when opportunity knocks, I go for it, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, I'm going to give it a shot. And, uh, and I've, I've had a hell of a life because of it. Not, some of it not so good. Uh, as, as TV junkie portrayed, but uh, most of it, for the most part, I've had an incredible life, and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything, the good, the bad, or the ugly. Uh, if you don't take a shot, you're not going to get any reward. So that's amazing to me that you not only had a lot of footage for the show, uh, but you had your own personal footage. You said that you had, for, for decades, been collecting, yeah. and it all got burnt in that fire. Yeah, I lost all of the footage in the fire. Uh, the, the only thing I didn't lose were all of the professional tapes over 40 years. They are in a, a fireproof vault down in Dallas. But I had kept personal possession of the, the diary tapes and lost them all. Is that right? Yeah. So just to give people a little context here. So whenever that fire took place, that was when 
Joe was under an investigation for the attempted murder of Carol Baskin. Correct. And uh, there, there's certainly some theories about who set that fire. Oh yeah, oh yeah, believe me, at the time the zoo fire occurred, Joe blamed everybody. He blamed me, he blamed Carol Baskin, he blamed the DJ down in Tampa, uh, anybody he could blame other than himself. Um, as the FBI though, at, when my second interview with the FBI over that zoo fire, as they told me, Rick, we actually believe that he did it because nobody else had a motive. Only right. he had the motive. Uh, for me to have started that fire, why would I have burned down what was going to be my retirement ticket, the reality yeah. show? It made no sense. We had just finished making the show. It was ready to be sold. Uh, so th the FBI was pretty assured that, that it wasn't me. So Netflix was not recording a show throughout. They came, it sounds like, after the fact. Yeah. And did they contact you or, or how did that how did that happen? Yeah, it's been about a year and a half now, a year and a half ago that Netflix, the producer, Chris Smith, first got hold of me and uh, said, Rick, we have this big idea. We'd like to do this, this uh, you know, network documentary series on the, the zoo, on Joe Exotic. And he said, out of all the people around Joe Exotic and in that zoo, you're the only one that is sane and credible. And would you mind being a part of this documentary because you're a, a reporter and you're there we can actually believe your story, whereas a lot of them were so eccentric and outrageous, we don't know what to believe. And I told him, sure, I'd love to do it. And uh, yeah, I was not paid for the documentary. Uh, so that, that lent, lent a, a little bit of credibility to it that I didn't receive any payment for it. Uh, I, now I look back in hindsight, I should have been paid as big as it went. <laughs> yeah. But um, we, uh, we met in Oslo about a year ago and uh, a little over a year ago and did the interview and it took three days to do the interview for, uh, for the series. And of course, uh, they interviewed uh, not only me, but every other participant that was there at the zoo at one time or another. What an amazing story. And uh, man, it's just such a bummer that that all your your or that most of your footage got <laughs> got burned up there. What a crazy story! Yeah, you know, I, when I tell you that you take advantage of, of good and bad opportunities when they come, uh, the fire was tragic at the zoo. I lost all of my TV show, most of it. I had some, but lost almost all of the video to it. But then turn around. And four years later, Netflix decides to do this big series. So something good came out of it. Actually, right. something entertaining came out of it. Uh, so there's a real good example of, of taking advantage of, of, of a, a, a negative. The zoo burned, I lost everything. But hey, on the flip side, they were able to take what I did have and make the Net Netflix documentary. So something good came out of something bad. And who would have ever guessed that it'd be one of the biggest documentaries of all time and that it would give yeah. a lot of people Strangely, give a lot of people comfort right as uh, COVID was breaking out. And yeah, you know, the, the coronavirus, uh, I, I have to credit the coronavirus uh, for, for half of the success of Tiger King. Uh, it literally came out as everybody was locking inside. And it was promoted so heavily that everybody, I, I've done interviews in 60 different countries on the planet. Uh, everybody around the world has seen this documentary series, and, and I think a lot of it is because COVID. Wow. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not every day that you hear anyone thanking COVID, but, but you know, we'll take, this, we'll take this one right to uh, right, right at heart. So what, what's next, Rick? I mean, you've been, man, you're, you're like, a, you're like a, a proven soldier, and you, <laughs> you just keep going. You know, you get knocked down maybe a little bit, and, and the, two fires that destroyed a lot of your life's work that you took a lot of pride in, no doubt about it, but somehow you dusted yourself off and, and you kept going and what's, what's next? You know, I, I uh, thanks to the documentary series on Netflix, I've had a lot of offers for, uh, for different things. Uh, I, I've actually done two documentaries since. Uh, one of them was uh, another autobiography, uh, autobiography doc, uh, documentary, uh, but I, what I'm seeing is that the Tiger King thing, there's so many things coming off of it. Um, right now, I'm actually looking at a, uh, this is really crazy. There is a, um, a legal marijuana farm in Oklahoma, one of the largest in the nation. And the guy has been talking to me for quite a while now about doing a reality show at this marijuana farm. And he's got a lot of crazy characters, just like the zoo had. 
And I'm seriously thinking about uh, when, as soon as I can, flying over and, and meeting with him and possibly doing that. But that's one of a dozen different ideas. It's just one that I can actually see. This is this could be a hit. I can I can see that'd be the first one of its kind. Nobody's done a, a, a you know a series on a marijuana farm, a reality show, and the characters that he has working there are just off the wall. So. Who knows what I may end up next? Like I say, I just keep my eyes and ears open. And uh, when the right one comes, I'll know, I'll fit in. I've got a question for you that I'm sure you've heard a great many times and uh, you don't have to answer by the way. <laughs> but uh, if you if you choose to answer, do, do you think that uh, Carol Baskin uh, killed her ex-husband? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't answer that question for the longest period of time until about two months ago. And uh, I did a special uh, for a TV in Sweden. And I decided it was time to, to, to come out and talk about it. You know, Carol Baskin and I are Facebook friends and her and, and, and her current hu husband, Howard and I, we talk, uh, I wouldn't say regularly, but we've talked four, five, six times since Tiger King came out. And uh, so she wasn't real happy in, in this Swedish TV show when I did talk about it finally. In my honest opinion, uh, Carol was behind uh, the disappearance and, and probably murder of her ex-husband. Wow. Uh, I, I add that up because the man was a millionaire. Uh, he, he had places to live in, in, uh, in South America and all over North America. He had everything going for him in his life and one day just disappears. No body, no nothing. Nobody that rich and, and that big and fruitful a life just disappears off the face of the planet. There was no ransom note or anything to ever come. Uh, he, all of his money was still sitting there in the bank, all of his possessions. It, it just didn't add up. And the only person that had any motive to, to do him wrong was Carol. And they were not getting along at the time. So uh, Carol Baskin isn't real happy that I talk about that, but you asked me my opinion. I do believe she was behind it. And I know they're investigating it again right now down in Florida, and we may very well find more evidence and, and find out that I'm correct. I, I think you have one less Facebook friend now. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> That's the funny thing. She has not unfriended me. Uh, yeah. She still sends a text here and there, which she was doing Dancing with the Stars. Uh, she sent me a text, Rick, did you see me dancing? And I'd already been talking about the fact that, Carol, I think you killed your husband. And but she just laughs it off. She just laughs about it. You know, uh, that's, that's one of the craziest things about the story is that as bad as Joe Exotic, you know, was, that people hated Carol even more, oh, yeah. <laughs> which oh, somehow yeah. made, made Joe a good guy. It you know what, like Carol, Carol Baskin is just as bad as Joe was. She, she may not be in jail for trying to kill him, but she's just as bad as he was. Her, her animal park is just as bad. All of them featured in the, Net, the Netflix documentary. They're all the same type, the same breed of people. Uh, they're power hungry people and owning a big cat, you know, only hundreds of big cats uh, is a power trip. Uh, you, you have to be around tigers uh, like I was in the zoo to where you get in a cage with an animal that's twice your size that could easily kill and eat you. There's a power trip when you come out of that cage like you're Superman. Well, that's, that's the type of people that are attracted to these roadside zoos like Carol's and Joe's and Doc Anton and some of the other people. Uh, they're a very strange set of people. Uh, you, you have what we call the monkey people. They all own monkeys, and they're very strange in their own right. But the tiger people are by far power trippers. Uh, they love the power of knowing I own tigers. So she's just as bad as Joe. Don't, don't let her fool you. And I think that's one reason that some, a lot of people sided with Joe in watching the show is that, you know, a lot of people pointed out that he and Carol were actually a lot alike. You know, that like you said, the power trip of owning the tigers but Carol was claiming to be a, you know, savior of the tigers. And Joe wasn't trying to sugarcoat, you know, the fact that he, you know, was running a zoo. Yeah. Uh, so it's such an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really hard to believe that I ended up, after my life, I've had such an incredible life and I've been involved in some huge things and projects in my life. It's really hard to believe that I actually ended up in that zoo uh, the year that everything was going on. 
uh, and that we're now sitting talking about my year in the zoo. Um, Carol Baskin and Joe and Travis, his, his boyfriend, husband, and John, his other boyfriend, husband. Uh, these, are, these are all people that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis. These are all people that, that I lived with in the zoo. Uh, maybe not Carol, but I, I knew her. I talked to her while I was working there on the phone. Uh, so it, it's really strange for me now to be looking back and, and it be so popular amongst the world because of that series. Rick, and, and a truly an amazing story, and I, it started all the way back before you were 14 years old, <clears throat> doing the recordings, doing all of those things. You had foresight, um, you know, doing th doing things that people would never dream to do, even then. And now, now today, like you say, we have the best cameras on the planet, and they're right on our phones, <laughs> yep. you know, for what have you. This has been a pleasure, and, and I encourage, you know, Tiger King is one thing. But I found it really fascinating turning the pages back and, and looking at your start and encourage folks, it's never too late. You said it earlier, it's never too late to start, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that opportunity is. And, and uh, you've had plenty of hurdles. And, and folks, as you, uh, as you uncover more about Rick and, and some of the things and stories about his life and where he is today, I, I just feel, I feel privileged to be able to share this story with Jared and, and and Rick, amazing, my friend. And a one thing that Jared and I promise you, if you come to Texas, specifically the Dallas area, to visit some family, there will be homemade barbecue. We won't go to a restaurant. There'll, there'll be homemade barbecue, and we will we'll fire it up like no one's business. You guys be careful, because I will take you up on that. What I would love and give to have some homemade Texas barbecue right now. We don't have that here in Norway. <laughs> and I know for a fact that Brent does not get his uh, meat off of the uh, expired Walmart truck. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? That, that, it was hard to believe he actually fed that meat to the people working at the zoo. But that's a whole other story. We, we've covered enough of that. <laughs> that's right. Well, Rick, uh, again, on behalf of both uh, myself and Jared, episode number 85 of Breaking Business Barriers, you broke hundreds of barriers and, and certainly an encouragement um, to all of our listeners and, and, and what have you. Rick, thank you very much. Halfway across the globe, it's dinner time in Oslo. And, and uh, thank you again. And, and as, we've, as we wrap it up, we'd like to say it is definitely onward and most definitely upward. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for taking the time, Rick.